You're just an afterbirth, Eli. You slithered out of your mother's filth. They should have put you in a glass jar on a mantelpiece. Um, well... <laughs> <laughs> You know, <laughs> don't don't ever talk to Noah like that. <laughs> You're just an afterbirth, Noah. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, but uh, that very, is very actually hurtful. dialogue from the film. <laughs> there will be blood. That's the film that we're going to discuss today. Paul Thomas Anderson's There Will Be Blood. I personally love this film. This is my favorite PTA. The first time I watched this film, I was jet lagged. It was three a.m. And I was in an Airbnb on my own and I was surfing Netflix wide awake, couldn't sleep. And uh, I just was like, wow, that looks awesome. What's this film? And I put it on, There Will Be Blood, and it just grabbed me. And the thing about There Will Be Blood is that I had no context before the film of what it was going to be. And it just absolutely hit me for six. Like I was uh, probably about 24, 25 years old. Same age as you, Jackson, when you saw it, because you've just seen it recently? Yes, sir. 24. Did it, uh, what would you say? Blow your socks off? Yeah, I thought it was amazing. Like, obviously, as we're doing this whole PTA watch, every movie so far in this PTA run is the first I've seen of it. I've not seen any of these movies before. And also, apart from this being my first time watching There Will Be Blood, Mm. I realized this is also my first time watching Daniel Day-Lewis on screen. Wow. I I went through his filmography and i realized i've not seen a single fucking movie with daniel day lewis in it i'm pretty sure he doesn't make many yeah that's fair yeah yeah he, not as many as like i don't know like if you'd call him a um, yeah he's a movie star he's a film star no doubt about it but not in terms of like your conventional commercialized movie star um, mm-hmm. i don't think he has a need to work as regularly as someone like that and he's just like i'm if it's good if i'm into it i'm gonna do it if not I'm just gonna. I mean, I think he lives in like a village with his wife. He loves his mm. wife. He, he, he loves. He his makes family. shoes now for yeah. a living. I fucking love. Yeah, Imagine so being much. a shoemaker and you're a great actor, performer, mm. creative, whatever you want to call it. And when you get the call up from someone else that you really respect and you know they are highly competent and do great work, you're like, yeah, I will. I will do that. So he, he ends up making like a film every seven years now or something. Mm. Mm. I, I think he's done. He has, has he made one since Phantom Thread? He, he's he's retired. Retired. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's and he, yeah. damn, he's stuck to it. Mm. But I respect that for him as an actor because I feel like most actors these days in a professional sense feel like they have to take like so many roles per year just to remain in the spotlight. And so they keep taking roles that are, you know, sometimes good, but oftentimes like They can not dilute. Worth it. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they can saturate the market. But I I respect that from Daniel, like, not really feeling the sense to be in the spotlight and continuously working to make sure that, you know, he's in the industry. He can just take whatever role he wants and he'll always smash it out of the park. I think he's won three Academy Awards. Yeah. And he's done, like, 30 films too, right? Something like that. Look, he's done a lot of films. Like, 10% is, like, for an Oscar. (laughs) Still good odds. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's insane. Where's my Oscar? (laughs) I've done 10 projects, so can I have uh, one? And he's been nominated for a lot more. He got snubbed for Phantom Thread. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Big time. We'll get onto that later. We'll get onto that later, but... uh... The amount of preparation that Daniel Day-Lewis does for every role, which I think is really, really admirable, you could understand on these major productions, like There Will Be Blood or Lincoln or whatever the production is, that it would take five to seven years in order to, like, get ready for it, do it, and then rest after it as well and then you want some time off and then you want to go again i'm just saying he goes in so deeply instead of doing a surface level performance and doing like four projects a year he does one project every five six seven years and he goes in really really deep Mm -hmm. yeah after watching this i watched a couple of interviews with him and pta especially one on charlie rose and when I found out that this dude is not only British, but also like so soft-spoken <laughs> and gentle and like introverted, I was fucking blown away because this dude is a chameleon and his character in There Will Be Blood is absolutely ruthless. Can I mm. say as well, I think Daniel Day-Lewis is really cool. I think he's a really, really cool guy in mm. his interviews and like the way he dresses and the way he carries himself and all of that. Years ago, I really deep dived on like Daniel Day-Lewis and researched him a lot. He went to drama school, naturally, when he was a young 
young guy, young man, and didn't necessarily, I don't think, and Daniel, if you're listening, like, um, don't you know better than me, but I've seen in other interviews where he said he didn't really get on with even the people in drama school that much, and, and he said that he thought they were really weird, and they probably thought that he was really weird. So I don't know, the guy's just been his own person his whole life, and just an enigma, but he's just an incredible actor. Mm. He has one interview where they were asking him to promote something. I forgot what it was. It might have been Lincoln. But uh, he, he just found out that Heath Ledger died, like, that morning or something. And the interviewer was asking him questions. And he stopped, he like, stopped mid-interview. And he was like, I'm so sorry. This feels so unusual to talk about anything else outside of Heath Ledger right now. Like, I can, can we talk about Heath for a little bit? Or, you know, like, I, I don't want to talk about promoting my film with such a great actor gone like he's really in touch with um i guess just what's most important i think whatever that is but yeah, yeah he, i agree he, he he's gets really it in yeah touch. yeah he, he gets it you must have an incredibly well-rounded i don't want to say deep again but like incredibly well-rounded understanding of like what it means to be a human being the human condition like, mm. could you imagine going right out to the edge of the universe of being Daniel Plainview, then going right out to the edge of the universe of being Abraham Lincoln, and then you go back to being Daniel Day Lewis? You'd be, you'd be more, you'd have more wisdom because mm. of the schools of thought that you've now had floating around in your brain that you've had to go through because you've had to explore them for these characters that you also did well, really, really well. Yeah, it's. There's no way you could go that that far on. on amazing characters and then not have that wisdom back onto your life that's what i'm trying to say yeah yeah no what a career Mm. but with there will be blood jackson something i'm so curious about stylistically there's a lot of things with pta's first four films that are pretty similar like the whip pan to dolly in transition and just a lot of ways that the camera moves and how people kind of talk obviously this is a definite departure from that style or at least like a vast development of it what were some things that you noticed looking back at the other pta films that you've seen yeah it's definitely felt like a different pta film and i'm sure a lot of that is due to the fact that this one was adapted from a book i'm pretty sure that he read yeah um but it definitely seemed like the most cinematic weirdly enough like modern day cinematic rather than boogie nights and magnolia where it is a lot of cinematic shots like tracking shots but this one just seemed a lot more grand especially with the whole oil rig sequences blowing up massive fires in the distance and like the tracking shot of him running to get his son hm running back with the fire burning in the background. hw hw, yeah, HW. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry hw Upside this is down. my boy hw <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah it, it definitely felt different watching it but i think in the best way possible I don't know why, but I think a departure and style from his previous works like just kind of kept me interested in this whole run. And I'm yeah. sure it's just going to continue. I don't know if it was a different cinematographer or he just like kind of went wanted to go in a different direction, but... I think the same cinematographer. It's not a different cinematographer. Yeah, it changes wow. in the master. Yes. That's when he changes. Oh, yeah. okay, true. But uh, totally different style. The score is so different. Oh, fuck yeah. As well. Oh my God. <laughs> Johnny Greenwood's score. I watched this with my roommates and when he was running with HM, like... You're good. No, you're oh good, my you're god. Good. We're gonna have H- H- we're gonna H- have H- a problem H- with this. No, that's funny. H and H&M. M. Yeah. H&M. Rocking that fucking trip. Yeah. Oh, um, Rocking those t- pre-torn jeans. <laughs> when he was um yeah, when it was running with HW after the explosion mm. and then just had kinda had like the weird like upbeat sort of music. Yeah. It was like the sort of the drums and everything. We were all like, this music like weirdly doesn't fit but also works kinda well. I don't know what it was about it, but you'd think that for a scene like that, they'd have a lot more like deep, dramatic music. Yeah. This one just was so different to what I was expecting, mm. but I liked it a lot. That certainly would be the obvious way to go. Yeah. And I, yeah, Johnny Greenwood is uh, not known for that, for sure. He's uh, he always doing something interesting. Did he also do the score in Punch Drunk Love? Uh, John Bryan did. Oh, that's right. He okay. did do Licorice Pizza, though, which is one of my favorite. No scores but we'll get to that we'll later get to that. Yeah. yeah okay a question just before the podcast before we hit record that we were sort of debating hmm. the baby boy hw 
was Daniel Plainview, I think he was being humane in the beginning when the father of the boy, mm. you know, died in the, what would you call it, it, the oil well accident. Yeah, and his then, head crushed. Yeah, he was looking after the boy, but then he started to use HW as a manipulation tactic almost to achieve his business deals that he wanted to and to make him look like a good man, like a father figure. Mm. Just what an incredibly complex character. I don't know. Should we begin at the beginning and talk about... I think the first 20 minutes of the film needs to be spoken about. There's no dialogue in it whatsoever. It sort of lets you know what you're in for. Even Tarantino has... I'm sure a lot of great filmmakers have had opinions about Mm. about There Will Be Blood. But Tarantino particularly says there's a whole movie in the first 20 minutes before you actually get to the movie. PTA really just does it with a cut. But Daniel Plainview, the truth, the fact of the matter is that, you know, he really injures his leg and sort of breaks Mm. his leg and he's all fucked up. He crawls, maybe not crawls, but sort of slides himself all the way into town from that oil well. And it's really just done with a cut. But as Tarantino said in one of his opinions, there's a whole movie just inside of that one cut. How many days would it have taken to get back to town Mm. moving in that way? sliding yourself and that tells you so much about Daniel Plainview and the things that he's prepared to go through he had the vision for what he wanted to do with his life which was to become a big oil magnate a business magnate at that point he'd hurt his leg really bad but his vision was still out there in front of him so he just went through whatever he had to go through in order to get back on track with his vision Mm. I don't know I just think the start of that film just shows you how hard Daniel's willing to work I think yeah it does a lot of things I think it's like it shows his determination that's what I'm trying to say for for sure for sure yeah particularly around like well I guess survival and gaining wealth because I I, I'm a big fan of what the next shot is after that cut which is him laying on the floor of wherever they measure the gold or weigh it and he's got his leg in a cast it's like that's probably the first place that he went to you yes, know before yes. he's gotten medical attention like yeah. you know maybe the hospital maybe that's where he got the cast from but you know he's just like laying there while they're measuring his gold on the like, floor with a broken right leg. back on track yeah literally One just vision. straight into his into his goal but yeah it also makes you sympathize with him a fair bit because he's obviously felt a lot of pain it's very admirable how much effort he's put in but then, obviously, you learn about the other things that Daniel Plainview is willing to do for wealth. And so your idea of him, obviously, changes massively across the course of the film. But yeah, it's, it's interesting you start there. It's like, no one else is around, so he can't fuck anyone else over to get to where he needs to go this time. But like, he will when he yeah. can, because that's who he is. He's sort of like um, HW. He holds the baby out sort of in front of him almost as like a bit of a bargaining chip. Like, you know, when he goes to the ranch to meet with the family, Eli's family, and he tries to put up this big um, sort of facade, really, that Mm. he's a big family man and he can be trusted and all these sorts of things. But he was doing the cloak and dagger in that he said he wanted the land to use it for hunting, if I'm not mistaken. Quail eggs. Yeah. Yeah. Or just quail, hunting for quail. Hunting for quail. And and, and he said that that's how he ended up on the property was he was quail hunting, but really he got tipped off about from Eli or... Eli's brother. Eli's brother. brother. I don't know. (laughs) I can... can Yeah, please. But but he's lying, you know? Before we move away from that opening sequence, just quickly mention that I think what that sequence does really well is justify why Daniel Plainview doesn't believe in God because he doesn't Oh shit, yeah. He doesn't have to believe in God because he managed to achieve his wealth through hard work. Yeah. And, and so God, feels, God didn't save him. Right. And yeah. So he he sort of feels I think throughout the film that his fraud has some nobility to it <laughs> because it's on the back of hard work. As opposed to Eli, whose fraud he sees as completely disingenuous because it it doesn't seem that way to him that he's worked to be able to justify his fraudulence, which is totally, whichever way you slice it, they're both egomaniac liars, (laughs) but at least it does a little bit to like say, 
this is Daniel's character. He's he's worked to some extent for what he has. Put it that way. That's a that really good great. point. Yeah. There's a really good like sort of religious duality in there that you know Daniel very much being a non-believer, kind of believing he is his own god. Maybe even drinking the Kool Aid and thinking he is a god in some ways. And when we get to the end of the film, there's some to suggest such a thing yes and also um you know wants to be in a leadership position in a dictating position over the town and then you've also got all the eli stuff where is it sort of suggested that eli might be dialing up the drama of the religion a little bit speaking of definitely the, uh, of, the, of the scene that has to do with quail prices you know ace w asks him how much money are we going to give them for the land and plain view says i'll give them quail prices as opposed to oil, oil prices, prices yeah. yeah and then there's that initial scene probably the first scene of conflict in the in the movie daniel wants to talk to the father of the household and he says here's the prices i want to give you i want to give you you know whatever thirty eight hundred dollars or whatever it is and then eli says something like and what about our oil <laughs> and it's from that moment forward and speaking of camera movement the shots immediately become close-ups, which is mm. something we don't see a lot in a Paul Thomas Anderson film, <laughs> but we get into a shot reverse shot. It's pretty tight. It's a pretty tight shot reverse shot. And in that moment, there's, I think, an understanding that Eli understands who Daniel is and Daniel understands who Eli is. Yes. And that there's going to be this... Head-to-head. Head-to-head, mm. unspoken... Juggernaut. Um, like, we understand the game that we're both playing, but we're never going to state it explicitly in order to maintain both of our reputations. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Is it... Was that Eli or his brother? Oh, that's Eli. Okay. There. Yeah. So that's a funny thing. It was Paul. For people who don't know, I, I think this is, like, well-known about the film, so I, I'm hesitant to say this because you can Google this. But um, Paul Dano was cast at the very last minute for this film. There was another actor put in the position to play that role. Who, who, come on now, do you know who it was? I've forgotten the name, but um, not a very well-known actor. Like, it would have okay, been a I didn't know break that. for that actor. I didn't know that. And he got to set, and apparently there was about a two-week working period before the shooting was about to start. And for whatever reason, like, there's been rumours about conflict between Daniel and that actor and Paul and that actor. Like, actually, they didn't like each other or whatever whether or not it doesn't you know everybody's very cagey about it for obvious reasons it, he, that, and that actor put out some sort of statement to say something like um for whatever reason i know everybody who's gotten on really well and worked well with paul and it just wasn't the case for me so whenever they had a private meeting where he, they asked him to leave and that was four days before the shooting was starting so they needed to call an actor in in the last minute so credit to not only is, i think is this Paul Dano's probably best performance, mm. but he had four days to prepare before fuck the show started. That's insane. How in the fuck? And, and you're going across from Daniel. Yeah. And yeah. originally, supposedly, there was another actor cast to play Paul. I think because it's very because it's very confusing because Daniel, Daniel, Paul, Paul, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but um, there was another actor who was supposed to play Paul, Eli's brother, and apparently because Paul was so impressed with Paul Dano, he also had him play. The Paul. brother. And so there might be this, like, the, the movie sort of unintentionally, perhaps, but maybe now intentionally, because Paul's done it intentionally, creates this duality of, like, is Paul Eli an alter ego of Eli, or is he not? Which mm-hmm. wouldn't have been present if the original plan had held, and yeah. there would be another actor playing him. It's just an interesting thing to think about. But um, yeah, according to the, the rules of the film, if you take out the interpretive aspect... Yes, they are twin brothers. Yeah. But okay. I think that's very suggestive. You know, Tarantino, and I don't like to uh, challenge really on this sort of stuff, but Tarantino has stated that he thinks that Paul Dano was not as much of a tour de force as Daniel Day Lewis was well, in I the mean, film. What do you do? And I think, <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I think that's a little bit uh, that's a little bit harsh. Maybe I'll just say that's just a little bit harsh. Like firstly, Daniel Day-Lewis has got to be how many years older than Paul Dano at Mm. that point in that film. Yeah, and he didn't have four days to prepare. And he had more time to prepare. It's just maybe a little bit harsh. Absolutely. Um, He fucking killed it. Yeah, Yeah, and it's one of the best performances ever on the screen. I love Tarantino, don't don't get me wrong, but I just heard that criticism and I was like, ah, that's just a little bit harsh. If I was going to lob any criticism against this film... I have like next to none, but that wouldn't be one of them. <laughs> the yeah. Performance is weak. Had you heard that yeah. as well, Noah? I heard that Tarantino recording, yeah. Yeah. And I think that, I don't know. 
I like some of Tarantino's film opinions. That's a bad. Thing. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> he's he, he's he's had a couple of takes that I don't agree with yeah. about PTA's catalog. The other one about the Boogie Nights thing that we already talked about. It's yeah, like, look, I'm not trying to make a problem, but I just yeah, yeah. I just yeah, want to no, no, no. I just want to shout out positively for my boy Paul Dano, who I've he never met. He does a great but job. He, yeah, yeah, he does he's a great amazing, job. That's all I want to say. Yeah. He's, he yeah. just does a great job. And I did not know that the four days of preparation thing. Like, yeah, if someone said either. to me right now, Taylor, you got like four days to prepare. Learning the thing is one thing. Then being good in it, and then guess what? You're going up against Daniel Day-Lewis. Mm-hmm. People say acting is um, team sport. And it really is, because you as the team need to all go somewhere together and as you do your job as a teammate they do their job and it's like a dance and you get there together even though you're dancing through the emotions you're getting there together mm. okay but Paul's character and Daniel's character are completely at odds the whole film so yeah you are kind of going up against Daniel Day-Lewis and you think Daniel Day-Lewis is going to pull any punches he won an Oscar for this performance mm. he, he's going hard he's going hard as fuck literally yeah. as in pull punches <laughs> yeah as well oh yeah actually hit Paul yeah <laughs> yeah yeah. Okay, there's God some more stuff Paul. in there. There's some more stuff in there. Paul but hit him back. So I just think Paul <laughs> True. And and this performance, without getting too much into it, did lead has led to a career of people believing Paul in like weird performances. Like prisoners with Denis. Mm. He's great. Sort of similar ish, but he's great in that. He's awesome in that, yeah. Yeah, and then uh the Batman with like Matt Reeves mm-hmm. playing the Riddler, like he's great in that, like yeah. a big commercial hit of a film. He did a great job. I think he... I don't think it was ever in doubt. <laughs> but but, but I, I totally... I, I know where you're coming from. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I feel like it's like... I don't know. Dare I say... Sorry, Mr. Tarantino. It's a little bit unnecessary to say like... Oh, okay. Well, Daniel, who had one of the best performances ever in the history of cinema. I don't think I'm out of line saying that. No. It's like, oh, his co-star also didn't have one of the best performances ever in the history of cinema. Cinema. It was just a really good performance. Yeah. Boo. <laughs> How is that even? Do you know what I mean? Like what? Well, it's everybody's gonna have, I think, their own biases towards what sort of performances they like as well. Mm. I'm pretty sure in that recording or in a similar interview regarding There Will Be Blood, Tarantino says something like, "There Will Be Blood is like one of the best movies of the decade or whatever." I per- but he says I personally prefer the. Uh, style and the attitude of boogie nights and i'm like no shit you're quentin tarantino <laughs> yeah <laughs> if you had if you had all of paul's films lined up and said which one of these do you think tarantino likes the most it's like, boogie like, which one yeah. do you think you would point to you know what i mean so you, you had a question before about the whole hw thing what do we think so then he's out so so plain views out there digging the oil well and the father of the boy of hw um he wouldn't have been named that plain view would have named him that right mm gets his head crushed yeah by a um, oh yeah the thing falls down yeah, dude falls, that's falls on savage his head. Eh? Yeah. like that's yeah. you're out you're gone cold done and, and, they're, and they're digging the oil out and it's got blood in it yeah yeah then so Daniel sort of takes on board the baby and at the time you're thinking oh he's caring for it naturally but then he does start to use HW as like a part of one of his um, pawns in his game if you will of chess yeah. that he's playing and then even later on tries to like be rid of HW. And then when HW comes back to him, he tries to act like he didn't try to be rid of HW. So yes, a very manipulative character. Mm. I, I feel like Daniel is never not playing the long game. That's my opinion. Because, because there was a number of people on that drill site. And like, yes, Daniel might have hired him. So he might have felt personally responsible for the incident that killed him. There's a chance there, so he might have taken HW on for that reason. I think that Daniel knows in the future what having a son can do because he's whenever he's negotiating, he's always pushing the fact that it's a family business that he runs and he's always like trying to buy property from families. So he's trying to find this common ground because outside of that, he's just a... He's just a lone man, and then suddenly he can present like he's providing not just for himself, but for his son, Mm. who they can see and they can shake hands with, you know. It's a sales technique at the end of the day. It is, yeah. I think he knew that. It's a sales technique. And I'm guessing there, because he never confirms it, but like... I think that's that was his intent with saving that kid. I, I think, think he so. could have easily because how many kids would have been left behind in that um, era from that kind of thing, you know? Oh, so many. Like especially traveling back to town and stuff, you know. I'm sure that would have been a common thing. He also by having HW shows the person he's trying to do a deal with that he 
has the same values as them yeah with a family business mm. and then that gets him on side and then that increases the likelihood of being able to get the deal done yeah yeah for sure and that first scene well the first negotiating scene where he's uh, talking to the entire town uh, about buying their land for oil mm. I love the fact that it does not go well for him and he refuses to actually do the deal because that kind of just sets up how actually business smart he is because if if nobody in this community is like unanimous with their decision to let him do this, it's just going to be a constant fucking headache for him in the long run trying to get this oil. Mm -hmm. So I think he knows it's better for him to spend his time actually looking for a community that has a lot of oil that wants him to do it than to just take the easy route and do this deal with these people. Mm. And it is very clear to me in that scene that HW is only there so that he can, you know, present himself as a family man. That entire scene is like one big fucking sales lesson. Oh, yeah. It's great. It just shows me how smart he is. Yeah. yeah I'm an oil man. Any other dude would have just taken the fucking deal and dealt with the issues later. He's smart enough to know that that wasn't the right decision to make. Yeah. He's very, yeah, sociopathic people, very intelligent. Yeah. a lot of the time unfortunately yeah he's 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 brilliant and i think i will get into this obviously i'm just gonna say this guys we've said this before about these movies spoilers yes. okay yeah fucking watch it please watch this before you listen to this episode because we're gonna i'm gonna talk about things that happen later in the film now is so an incident happens with hw at when the oil rig explodes and the fire happens and hw goes deaf Obviously, Daniel takes care of him for a little bit, but then he puts him on a train to send him off to... I think he con communicated with someone who was going to pick him up and take him to deaf school. And I believe he only gets him back after he publicly admits in the church that he abandoned his child, which is obviously something that he didn't want to do. He's kind of lost points with the community there a bit, yeah. but getting HW back gains him some points mm. and makes it look like it's like the prodigal son returning which is like so far from the fucking truth he's a child i think he uh, you, you think that's yeah, kind I of yeah I, I also think that he abandons his son a little bit earlier than that yeah when after that um geyser <laughs> of oil goes off yeah and he, he tries to save hw and you know it could be argued that maybe there's some care for the kid mm. but more important to him is the oil which yeah because he fire. runs back exactly oh yeah he, and hw says, saying don't go i can't hear you i can't hear my own voice is what he says and yeah. hw can't hear what he's saying so he you know the oil becomes more important to him than his son in that moment there's, yeah there's literally that line where somebody comes up to him and he's like yes. is hw okay he just goes no, no he's not <laughs> and it just he just does not take his eyes <laughs> off this fucking fire it's hilarious but it just goes to show where his priorities are yeah Big Succession vibes. Big Succession vibes, yeah. Shout out to Succession if anyone's watching it. But anyway, we're off topic. But um, I'm not, but I will. You should. <laughs> it's great. In in Succession, not to get into it, but Logan Roy really does a lot of that with his four children where he, well, and even some associates work for him in the company where he just plays everyone against each other, uh, however can be advantageous for him at the time. Yeah. And uh, it's probably worth saying while yeah. we're still on the topic of other films, <laughs> two films prior to this, Magnolia is a film in which father-son relationships are explored very deeply. Mm. Yeah, and so right. And so two films later, <laughs> it's a little bit funny that we would come back to a similar topic. I think on the Charlie Rose interview, Jackson, which you mentioned earlier, there's actually a mention where um, Rose challenges Paul about why this story again or something like this and Paul apparently said something like well as I was writing this one uh, I thought am I really writing this again <laughs> you know? yeah. so it's not like he wanted to write it again yeah. which is quite interesting but I, it's you know worth pointing out that I definitely think there's some parallels of father abandonment <laughs> yeah. out and then in this again <laughs> Yeah. Do you think there's also religious parallels? Because I know that particular scene where Eli wanted to uh, do a blessing on yes. the oil rig. Yes, we should get into it. Oh, amazing. And Please talk about, yeah. 
Well, this connects to it exploding as well, but yeah. Yeah, ex ahead. exactly. And Daniel, you know, he does say, sure, like, I will let you do that. And then obviously when the time comes, he, just, he cuts him out. He essentially himself. puts himself in the blessing yeah. and he also puts um, Mary, the young That's girl, right. in the blessing. Yeah. And sort of blesses, the, yeah, so he, but in, it's deliberately done, obviously, to undermine Eli. Yeah. I think they're both sort of competing in some sense to be the leaders of the town that they've created. And, you know, you could argue that the town is just a small metaphor for America <laughs> as a whole because of what happens in the 20th century, obviously. Mm. Yeah, well, um, Daniel uses, like, the promise of money to these people. Yes. He says this will give your community, like, an excess amount of money where you can buy bread and, you know, a loaf of have, bread. All of these <laughs> have all of these riches. But um, uh, Paul Dano's character uses, like, the promise of, you know, God's faith to try yes. and draw these characters, mm. uh, this community together. So yeah, I think when you say there is a resemblance to like America between mm. capitalism or religion, you yeah. know, money and faith. That's the definitely the film to me, at least. Yeah. Is that that duality? Yeah, for sure. Are they symbiotically sort of uh, attached to each other, like um, Daniel and Eli? Like they need each other? I think in some sense, well, whether or not Paul meant it this way, they sort of end up being stand-ins for the postmodern age in America, we saw that shift in the 20th century where people became skeptical of religion and the thing that really ended up controlling people was the economy and money because that led to political power at the end of the day. And churches used to hold all the political power, but then it became more important that money did. But we can get into that. That's more for the end of the film. Yeah, sure. mm -hmm. yeah, I'll just sure. mention quickly about uh, yeah. HW that... um. So first of all, that set piece is awesome, but but there yeah. is a but there is a scene when the, they first find oil, when Daniel first finds oil before he takes the son away. You see presumably who that son's father is. There's a religious metaphor, visual metaphor in that scene, where Daniel takes the he sort of like um, strokes the oil off this whatever it is that they're using to take the oil out of the mm. ground and he like his hands all covered in oil and he like holds it up to the sky and there's essentially a shot that goes oh up yeah as if it's like a blessing and that's followed by or prior to a shot of presumably whoever uh, hw's dad is taking some oil and essentially like christening baptizing hw with it uh, like putting it on his head and this is probably one of my favorite instances in all of Paul's films of like really great foreshadowing in screenwriting and because it's just done visually because he's initially baptized with this little piece of oil and it's almost like he's marked for death or pain by oil because he's once again <laughs> yeah. completely baptized by all that oil that comes out of the ground yeah it like coats and completely covers him yeah and in a sense daniel's also baptized by it as well because when he goes to save him they're both shrouded in oil. does that make daniel god if he's an oil god uh not really you don't really feel that <laughs> I don't if really you're then baptized like... by oil on the forehead uh, kind of a little bit i think what makes daniel a, a more of a godlike figure has to do with him being as he in the final scene he declares himself the third revelation which is i mean i don't know how far i want to get into this drinking the kool-aid there for yeah. sure what, what is the, the third I, oh, okay. I, I don't so know so eli's the third church revelation is, is called yeah. the third revelation oh yeah the right yeah yeah and if you go into like what the third revelation is biblically or like religiously there's some debate about what the revelations of god are but like the most generally afforded consensus is that the first revelation of God is when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, the second one was Jesus in the flesh, and the third one is stated in this, it's somewhere in Luke, I think, but it's like any man who preaches the accurate word of God or whatever, like from God or whatever, uh, can be considered the third revelation or something like this. And then oh, Eli wow. sort of, he has the church of the third revelation. In a sense, he's declaring himself the third revelation. Mm which is a very, my, you know, in my opinion, a very egocentric... That is <laughs> so Machiavellian, yeah, jeez. Yeah, and in that final scene, which we'll get into later, but Daniel does declare himself, he points to himself as he's chasing Eli down the bowling alley, he's like, I am the third revelation. Damn. Can I say something so that sick. always stuck with me massively from just that scene? This is much smaller note than all of the larger stuff that you were just talking about, Noah. But... Could you imagine having so much of an abundance of everything? He's got all the riches that he could want, wealth, business, food, all the rations you'd ever need, he's got. And there was once a time when he didn't so much have that, when he was at the very beginning of the film, out in the well, digging it, trying to build himself up, right? Could you imagine being so full up of abundances that you 
chew a steak. This is a, would have been a, the most expensive steak that you could buy at the time, right? And yet you're so full already, and he's so bored in his mansion that you spit the steak. You 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 have this, the the taste of it, but your stomach is already so full because you're so full of abundances that you spit the steak back out. He didn't swallow the steak. He bites the steak, mm. tastes it, but he's already so full. He's just so bored. He's got nothing else to do but to eat. Mm. And he spits it back out with the taste of it in his mouth. That's a very interesting... Um, that's always stuck with me. That's, that, I, that's, I, I yeah. love that interpretation of it. I like it more than... So I've heard Daniel speak about that scene in interviews. And he says the reason that he spits the steak out is because his teeth and gums would have gone by that point because there was no dental care Uh in in the the 1920s (laughs) or whatever it is and so that's why he's spitting it out because he can't actually chew anymore fair enough that's what I got from it I I got (laughs) that from it am I the only person on earth that got that (laughs) from it it's it's a good it's a good thought I didn't think of it but that's no that that that's really that makes a lot of sense that's what I the kind of guy to taste steak just because he can and then spit it out (laughs) that's what I I thought he was so full because he'd been so bored you know for so long i thought that was making a comment on how wealthy he was then yeah, yeah. um anyway that's what i got from it i guess that that is wrong what i got from it is wrong then i would go no, with no, no. What i wouldn't call it i wouldn't call it yep it's everything's up for grabs yeah but then if the actor comes and says no this is what the actual decision was there then you've got to go with um daniel day lewis's decision on that because that's what he actually meant. I don't know. Say, is it uh, wrong to think that Paul is an alter ego of Eli, like Eli posing as Paul, but just because he was recast, or is that a valid? Do you think that there was actually two characters there, or do you think there was one character and someone was, and and he was like having an alter ego, like a Clark Kent Superman thing going on? Well, there? I mean, I know how it originated, but that doesn't mean that there's no. If you take away the context of all of the making of the film and you just watched the film and you knew nothing about it, what would you actually get from it? Is that what you're saying? I don't know. It doesn't regard. It doesn't mean that there's any that there's no wisdom to be garnered from thinking about it that way. I mean, it's it's pretty interesting to think about the idea that Eli posed as a twin brother of himself so that he didn't have to sell his family out under his own name. Mm. Like that's pretty interesting, <laughs> even if it was never intended. Because he doesn't, you know, it's a bad thing. He does a bad thing to sell his parents out of his place for some oil money. Mm. You know. Yeah. Interesting. Should we talk about the arrival of the long lost brother? Mm. Yeah. When I first watch it, you get into halfway through, and Daniel's made himself quite successful now, and you and I'm thinking, you know, if you pause it, you can see like there's still like an hour plus of this movie left. Mm. So like, what are they going to bring in? And there's sort of the brother who comes and finds Daniel Plainview, which really that is a con. The whole thing is a big con by this guy, right? To find a way to attach himself to riches and safety. That's like a good 40-minute story of itself inside the movie. So let's let's get into that chapter. Isaac, you want to say anything? I think the thing that's most interesting to me about that relationship is how Daniel kind of starts to confess things that I think that he wouldn't confess to anyone else, to his yes. brother. Mm. That that That's what is so striking to me. It reveals some importance about how Daniel really does place a lot of value onto bloodlines and yeah. blood as a whole. He doesn't treat HW in that way, even though, you know, he's his fake sort of adopted son. Yeah. This real brother yeah. gets all this sort of information about how he really is in a way. It's that's very- another thing I was yeah. going to say, is that like... If HW or if Daniel had have actually had a biological son, even if no one else knew, because he kind of, if no one asks, he doesn't tell them that HW isn't actually his biological son. Oh, he lies. He lies to uh, the first people I think he makes a little deal with, or the second saying, they ask where's his mother. The mother died. And That's he what said he said. She died in childbirth, which mm. of course, there was no mother. That is right. <laughs> yeah. That is yeah. right, yeah. So if Daniel had have actually had a biological son, would he have treated that son differently to HW and that's why also believing that the brother was biological to him he gave him more information it may have also been that the brother was like 20 to 30 years older than HW so therefore you could there's certain things you could share with him as a man that HW may not have been ready to hear yeah but also there is definitely some bloodline stuff going on in there yeah I think there's also a part of it where it's like I don't think Daniel, and also I don't think he's wanted one, but I don't think Daniel's ever had a friend. I was going to say that as well. At least not in the film. I think he 
feels like he's kind of got someone that he can talk to, which is when he says such a despicable thing that he says, where he says, I don't want to just win. It it hurts me to see anybody else winning. I want, I don't want no else one else to succeed. Yeah, I don't want anyone else to succeed. I hate most people. Yeah. Most people would take that to the grave if you felt that way. Yeah. yeah. So. You, you just have to take that. Do you think Daniel may have wanted a friend even if he didn't want to admit it? You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, like the weakness. Like, is there weakness deeply, even if it's unspoken, in that character? I yeah, for sure there is. It's no accident that he's like so miserable and bored in the mansion at the end. I think part of that is also because he's he has no one to enjoy it with. Yeah, he has this like confidant when um, H W tries to meet him. Oh yeah, his, um, sign language uh, translator. He says, um, this is my closest whatever friend, what, and it's not a friend, it's a guy who does his voice. Yeah, he just, he's, he's paid to be there, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Even in that scene where they are uh, speaking about, I want no one else to succeed, whatever, he says that he wants to make enough money to live in isolation of everybody else, is a thing that he says, which of course he gets the wish, you know mm. what I mean? But he that's that I tell you what, that's not the best yeah. game plan ever. Like you know, <laughs> you know what would be yeah. absolutely. Yeah, you know what would be a better yeah. game plan would be like to make a little bit. You want to make some money. There's nothing wrong with money. Like okay, you want to do well. You can do great things with money, right? Mm. But like, how about we just make some good coin and then learn how to also take part in society in a positive way. There might be more important mm. things than money. Maybe. <laughs> I don't think yeah, so. I don't think so. No, yeah, no. You know, so th- this guy is, um, and I wanted to touch on this note. Daniel is like seriously messed up. <laughs> and, you know, you know, I mean, it, it's stated in the obvious, but it's, it's so true. Well, right? he, he is, he is. And, and yeah. I want to know what happened to him because when you first meet him at the v- very beginning of the film, what happened that created these behaviors in him? Mm. Was it inherited or did it happen to him? Hmm. But yeah, he's pretty messed up at the start. He's still messed up at the end, but just more of it sort of comes to light. Uh, that yeah, he's what willing. He's willing to go further to protect his wealth, <laughs> to be the winner of the game. It's the I think Daniel Day Lewis has said this in a few interviews where he was essentially like, what his problem is is that, and what was probably the case for a lot of these oil miners and a lot of the silver miners, like it is at the start of the film that once that was over and they have even if they had achieved this massive wealth it was actually about the game and about the work of doing the thing that they that's what they were actually interested in whether they would acknowledge that agree to that or not that is actually about the process of getting the oil out of the ground and not the actual wealth that they would attain according to a, a paul i think paul has said they either did or wanted to shoot some scenes of daniel in his mansion camping in like a tent <laughs> and oh, then, oh. like in the sense that he always wanted to like yeah, that's yeah. where he belonged he still wanted to rough it yeah there's even like throughout the film uh, and in the final scene Daniel is wearing like blue shirts like blue denim shirts and like he's a blue collared worker yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. sort of thing love it and there's this great um, line that Paul said I forget which interview he said it in but he said um, he said that he thought a good subtitle for the film would have been you can take the boy out of the mine shaft but you can't take the mine shaft out of the boy <laughs> which is like also like I think one of the main <laughs> things that the film's getting at yeah yeah that, that would have been awesome <laughs> it's yeah that's so true isn't mm-hmm. it Daniel just like beating people it wasn't actually yeah. about the money no comment. Yeah, I re- I reckon maybe here's a good question: When was Daniel the happiest or most satisfied in the film? Great question. I don't know. I've got well, like while killing anyone. Yeah, <laughs> I, <laughs> that's probably yeah. my guess as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think so. I love how that line that he says to his confidant coincides with the end of the film, as well. It's like, hey, I think I'm finished now. Yes. And then it's, that's it. <laughs> the film ends. I, I think he was also probably at his most content just before realizing his brother was not actually his half brother when they're on the beach talking oh, about the yeah. beach tree. Dance. Oh yeah. Like I think he was. That's a good guess. At that, his most calm and. You know. that amazing. The tra- I love when he figures that out and you get that score and that wave. Yeah. Oh, and, and he's just looking at him. No, he's gonna. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> also, to your point, Taylor, earlier of the idea that he wants an actual uh, like friend or someone to be with or whatever. Yeah. I think that's probably, and I should have brought this up earlier, but I think that's revealed quite clearly when he's reading his brother's diary after it's been burnt by H.W. and he's like crying over it. It's like he really wanted his brother, you know what I mean? But mm. it was not the case. No. Not the um, he got conned, so he which just sends him... I think it's, it sends yeah. the other guy. Yeah. Fuck. Maybe the part when he was feeling the best was when he found the oil at the very start and he holds his hand up. Mm. To yeah, the sun. I had one of my yeah. one of my guesses was gonna be when he's laying on his back with his broken leg and they're measuring his gold. Mm. That'd be one of my guesses. I think you've got the right guess, Jackson. I can't lie. I think that's. I think you've hit because he's rich, he's wealthy, and he's finally found someone that he can like confide in. Yeah, and he got rid of fucking H W. Yeah, piece of shit. You yeah, know, I'll tell you. I'll yeah, tell you what, you after know, he tried to burn. His his brother, oh, so he so he literally picked his fake brother over H W. Yeah, because he, oh, like, he picked that, that... his fake brother over his fake son. Yeah, <laughs> fuck. This guy's seriously messed up. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get off this topic of Daniel being a real son of a bitch, yeah, <laughs> I want to bring up fire in the movie because I think it's important religiously. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, and I think it's important to the themes of the film. So there's like a few scenes with fire in the film. Most of them are around campfires. The first of which is when, probably the first time I think in the film, where Daniel truthfully says the lies that he's going to commit, or the evils he's going to, he says, we're going to give them quail prices, when he tells um, HW this over a fire. And then, of course, there's this huge <laughs> fire that Oil erupts fire, yeah. from the ground, which is literally, like, if you want to think of it as religiously, that's like the fires from hell coming up, mm. and like, which is what uh, Eli might want you to believe as a pastor, the fact that's why that thing burnt up. Then there's the next fire is when um, he tells his brother, that, or his not real brother, that he hates most people, and there's all this insidious shit that he feels about everybody, and then the last one is when he kills him. During the killing of him. That's so deep, Noah. The fire comes up every time he truly reveals himself to be a proper bastard. <laughs> Apart from in the last scene. Holy obviously. shit. But like, up until then. That's yeah. really true. deep. And, and, and when HW lights the fire mm-hmm. around his brother, because yes. he's obviously, like, jealous of him. Yep. Daniel takes him out and... Beats him. Whoops him yeah. really hard. Yeah. 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 Wow. That's... Mm-hmm. You're on the money there now. <laughs> this film's very religious. Like, yeah. Very, like, religiously interwoven. PTA yeah. is... That's one thing I've learned, especially from things that you've said, Noah, is, like, PTA is more religious than I realised mm-hmm. from, like, things that have been brought up on this podcast. Yeah. It's really... You could even probably... Very interesting. ...that the film is making... I don't know that it's making a case for religion, mm. but I think it's making a case against the dismissal of religion. And maybe yeah. Magnolia makes the same case. Not even, like, in a literal sense, but in, like, a... You discard these, like, moral stories at your own peril sort of thing. Yeah. Mm. Wow. A good woman, would that have maybe gone a long way to levelling Daniel Plainview out? I think it hurts oh, yeah. Daniel that his son has a wife. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, Because he yeah. marries Mary, which, by the way, Mary. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> if, if it wasn't enough, no religious shit. enough. Paul, <laughs> Eli, you know, think about these names. Yeah. Mm. I love the fact that Eli is basically like his, uh, you know, son-in-law yes. at that point. Yes. I'm sure that he fucking hates that. Yeah, for sure. I think I heard um, Day-Lewis say this in an interview to give him credit, but I think he has said in an interview something like, it must have hurt Plainview when his son... It must have hurt to see his son growing up straight, like growing up with like a responsible business version of mm. his own business with a family, yeah. with all the stuff that he doesn't have, even though he's this like huge rich guy. Yeah. And that would give him even more fuel to like yell at him and be a total <laughs> asshole. You Do you know? know what might even infuriate him so much more too is HW did it all while being deaf. Yes. Which would also, at the very crux of Daniel, you could argue that he's harder working. Yeah, which is which is very... Which would really fucking rub him the wrong way. Which is also connects very uh, artfully, thanks to Paul being a genius. Like, there's a reason yeah. he goes deaf and nothing else, and it's because this whole film is about lies. Like, mm. Daniel has to construct his own version of the English language that's basically just... He's a snake oil salesman, and, yeah. like, everything that he says to everybody pretty much is just... 
lie this way, lie that way in order to achieve wealth. And of course, HW can't hear anybody lie or tell the truth because he can't hear anything. Mm. <laughs> so there's this idea that's like, he and HW can't even talk, really. And so he, he comes maybe across metaphorically more uh, earnest and more honest because he almost can't lie. <laughs> he can't he's not susceptible and to... Yeah. The... And he's not susceptible to lies either. That's crazy. And then Daniel Day-Lewis went on to play Honest Abe. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. What, what range. <laughs> yeah, right. Incredible. <laughs> You're going insane. right out, yeah. right out to the... <laughs> and then right out to the other side of the spectrum. Yeah, jeez. That, man. I hadn't considered that. That really would... In what universe... I don't want to say it. This sounds mean, but I'm talking about fucking Daniel Plainview, so fuck it. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? I mean, I think most conversation you're going to have about him is going to sound... It's probably going to be negative. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Uh, I don't see a, a world where he finds a woman to love, man. No. I don't. Because she would, she would always be second and she would know it. Not the right so, kind like, of woman either. Like, yeah, he could, no. she, he could He could have had, uh, you know women no, I'm sure short plenty term, how do I say this respectfully very short term women who loved yeah, his wealth sure. yes but um, gold miners gold <laughs> <laughs> nice it's too easy I'm sorry if he had the gold married I yeah. think it would have been for the same reason that he adopted HM it would have purely just been to like have this family facade yes and also it was the 1930s he probably wouldn't even love her he'd just have her as like a housewife to do chores true one other thing that's probably worth mentioning is that there's some alcoholism in it as well like Daniel relies very very heavily on alcohol another shop that's really stayed with me you know the night that the big there's that big oil spill mm. yep. where it, when it's shooting up from the ground he wakes up at like 2 a.m and he's passed out with his face on the hardwood floor because he's just passed out because he got drunk is Daniel probably an alcoholic as well would you say yeah probably fuck yeah Absolutely. I mean, what else are you going to do at the end of the film when you have nobody? You know, mm. just money. He's just drinking and playing bowling yeah. in his two lanes. It's kind of sad that he put two lanes in, too. Oh, I'll I just never point thought of it like that. True. I never thought of it like that. He finally that. gets to have his game at the end. <laughs> Another thing that's not intentional. <laughs> that's not a set. Yeah. It's a real mansion. There you fucking go. But, uh, but nice. I feel cool like that's... That way. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, well, you would want to play bowling with someone, maybe wouldn't Paul, you? Paul did write that scene for that location. So maybe he did go, oh, look at that Yeah, one. too. Yeah. The other thing is that the bowling would have been... I mean, what year are we in at 1930-something? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Bowling would have been like right at the precipice of like the rich people's like totally. game that you could have installed in your house. Yeah. You know, yeah. now it's like a spa or a sauna or like a VR thing or yeah. something like mm. that. But bowling would have been, he's got everything and he's got nothing at the same time. Yeah. In the beginning, isn't he literally like shooting things down his hallway? He's like shooting. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, books or something. I think that's a good uh, substitute for the whole camping idea. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. That they would have put into the script. It's, it's like this nice, like, yeah, he's got all this shit, and you know what he wants to do? He wants to shoot it. <laughs> like, yeah. Just, just destroy this place that he's got. He's, it's that same idea of, like, he wants to be back in the mines doing something. Yeah, and, like, quail hunting. Like, yeah. shooting yeah, the exactly. fucking quails. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To shoot in the bottles. That's, gonna, that's a real skill, you know, when you get on the other side of achievement. People get depressed and all that, and people become unhappy because you've done it. So it's probably something to be said too for the, the way in which he got there. Yes, <laughs> that yeah. might cause him yeah. to feel bad about what he's done. Yeah. Okay. Do the ends justify the means? No, probably not. <laughs> Fuck no. <laughs> Nothing he does justifies anything he does. <laughs> I think he's bad from beginning to end, and he has a little moment where he gets a bit of compassion because he feels like he's got his brother, and then it gets ripped from him. So he's bad at the beginning, and he just gets worse, and it, and it just so. comes more and more to light that he's yeah, uh, just how bad he is. And I, it's just it's just the fact that it, as we watch him in the story, also where learning more about him as we go as well so there's there's that we're just getting context i yes, think he's just yeah. misunderstood man i, <laughs> <laughs> I love that <laughs> paul dano is dark. the protagonist he just, of yeah the he we, just uh, yeah <laughs> he just wants a friend can, can we know? tie up this thing about um hw and daniel and then move on yeah. to the eli and oh uh, yeah daniel sure Conf- Conf- yeah so, yeah. So yeah, yeah, the yeah, H- yeah so the hw thing hm the hm yeah I love you. The HM thing. The HW thing. 
that final scene where HW comes to his house yeah. says that he is splitting off from the business mm, and he wants to make his own Mayan yes yeah. and then Daniel essentially says now you're my competitor <laughs> so I don't want basically nothing to do with you and tells HW that he was never his son mm. there's even that little moment where the translator doesn't want to translate it yeah what he said what I said yeah and then he does it and then HW has to like absorb all of this stuff and it ends off with like the best line ever and HW says and it's a religious line as well thank god that they are or that I have none no of you in me which yeah. is like an amazing <laughs> like light because it's you know I don't have to explain it it's a double entendre it's biological and it's meaningful like it's brilliant and then he he ships off and the the best thing about it is when daniel keeps yelling that you're a, you're oh a yeah bastard, he, he can't, he can't hear, hear any of it yeah he can't hear what he's saying which is beautiful i love that scene it's a great great scene yeah it's beautiful mm -hmm. i mean the movie is just filled with great great scenes isn't it yeah the whole thing mm. i mean there's not one scene in this movie where i'm like you know you could have cut that one out i want to say something about the the shooting for this film which is funny which is that the scene in which, and we should get into this Eli conflict, the scene in which Daniel takes Eli's face and like smushes it into the mud and oh, yeah. rolls him all around and does all this stuff. That scene apparently was placed in the shooting schedule right next to the scene where Eli makes Daniel undergo a baptism in church. Right. So that, <laughs> so that Paul Dana's revenge could carry on. Immediately. <laughs> Immediately oh, to the next day of shooting, which is awesome. so funny. That's so I good. I love that. I love how he slaps him. Yeah. He's straight arm. Oh, it's great. He looks like he's never slapped someone in his life. No, 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 but yeah. he's just doing it like... Yeah. how someone who's like not been taught how to like strike or something right. would do it is like if i get the most swing this is gonna hurt he's making most. a huge effort to like yes. humiliate him as much as he possibly can yeah and then daniel has to say this stuff about like i i want the blood i want the blood yeah which is it, it's, it's a double entendre again hilarious and also yeah. It, it, yeah and it's very it's like he wants the blood of paul Dano for yeah. humiliating him and then he gets it yeah <laughs> but it's so which great. is insane because it's like it's like he's committing getting the blood of paul Dano is his greatest sin yeah probably in the film yeah but then also like paul Dano is like receiving the blood is like being cleansed of your sins mm -hmm. so it's like a perfect opposites and it's a double entendre yeah, it's, it's fucking just like the writing is beautiful unreal writing. yeah i love at the end of that too where he it's all said and done he just goes that's a pipeline <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. he didn't care he did it's, not give a fuck it's very interesting that yeah yeah he's like smiling and laughing isn't he yeah yeah Far even out. when he's like he says eli says something like do, do you accept god or whatever and he's like yes i do yeah like <laughs> this weirdly comical like yeah. phrase yeah he doesn't care he just is going with it daniel always has this one up on eli because he doesn't care about blasphemy yeah. and Eli does care about blasphemy. Mm -hmm. Whether Eli is um, actually religious or not is one thing, but he's definitely posing as somebody who can like do faith healings, for example. And Daniel makes it clear to him that he knows that that's bullshit very early on. Like once they're talking in front of the church after the first service that he sees. Oh yeah. And he goes, that's one hell of a show. And walks off. It's like, that's very clearly telling Eli that I know that you're full of bullshit. Yeah. I want to say something about the church, which is really cool. So the church is, when we first see it in the film, it's this like small, very dark shack of a place. It's like, it's... Mu and oh, I think, yeah. I think Eli even comments that he wants to make it bigger later on. But it's like, and it's, it's dark in there, and all the wood is like dark, rotted away, like fucked up wood. And then the oil rig in town that gets built is all made of like really light colored wood and it looks great. It looks brand spank. It looks great. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And then at the end of the film, the rig is all stained with oil because it's black or it stains things. And so the rig is just covered in oil and the church has been rebuilt and it's rebuilt in this like beautiful light yeah. colored wood. And there's this crucifix in the back of it and this light coming through it and the whole bit. And it's just this like probably another thing that Daniel would like to get one up on Paul from, which is taking the, uh, what was the like nice star attraction building in town and flipping that. And so now the oil rig is this like horrible place that no one wants to look at and the church is this place that everybody wants to come to. It's just this nice little like filmic visual thing. It's like the balance of power has shifted. It's, mm. it's, it's really nice. Oh, I didn't I like even that. think about that. That's a great point. That's so true. 
It really is. It really is so much brighter now that you now yeah. that I'm thinking about it's it. It's super very bright. noticeable. And it's like yeah. coming out. It's backlight on Daniel as he's like yeah. doing the prayer on the whole bit. I love the sunlight cross. Yeah, it's fantastic. It just like br- brings it out. Whoever yeah. invented that one was that's good. good I've not seen that anywhere else. No, no, no. yeah, it's, it's kind of brilliant. Yeah. All right, so the finale. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. <laughs> let's talk about that shit. Let's do that one. Man, I, I, so I'll say this. So before I saw this scene, unfortunately, I was once a teenager who watched day in, day out, greatest acting of all time compilations, oh, no, like we all seen, did. No, so I, so I see it. So, I, so, I see, so I'd seen parts of it, yeah. but I, I was always confused because I'd seen it, but I'd seen it in sections mm-hmm. and I saw, uh, Daniel Day Lewis looking so defeated at the beginning and Eli standing above him. And then I would see other sections of the scene where Eli is crying <laughs> and he obviously does the milkshake line. Yeah. And I was I was so lucky that I got to the film. I didn't know what the transition was. Sure. I didn't understand why they switched. Mm-hmm. And uh, having that revealed in the film mm-hmm. so calmly, like was just like one of the most satisfying and also like disgusting things I've ever seen, probably. Yeah. To 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 just to say about this, yeah. That you're because of the physicality of yeah. it. It's worth mentioning like the blocking of it, the filmmaking of it, is that at the beginning it's it, you know, I'm probably what I'm gonna say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Daniel's passed out in a bowling alley mm. and Eli's stood and crouching over him, and by the end of the scene, <laughs> Eli is the one with his face in a bowling alley and Daniel's looking over him. Yeah. So the whole physical the, the the blocking of it is completely flipped by the end, which is great. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. And even like the left to right switch. Yes, I think there's yes. a scene where like Daniel's sitting down on that chair and then Eli ends up sitting on the yes. same chair and it's the eye lines like that's great. It's great. I'm pretty sure <laughs> extremely act- clear. Yeah. In acting school they always said cuz we had on this stage that we had, they had a door like so you're looking at the stage, might be different for the camera here, but so if you're looking forward at a stage, mm. there's a door on the left side and a door on the right side. What sides are they at at the beginning of that scene if they switch? Because I'm pretty sure they taught us an antagonist enters from the right. That checks out with the scene. And then because, protagonist- because he's in the beginning, Daniel's seated on the left and Paul is on the attack saying that I have this thing I can offer you. I have all this power over you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And then they switch. And then he's antagonizing him and telling him that he's actually drained that entire area of oil already. Right. And he had no idea. Right. That's right. And, yeah. a, and a protagonist enters from the left. This would be different for the camera from what, the way the camera's looking. Mm. But just as a basic fundamental of the way that the viewer sort of reads. Mm. Yeah. If you're trying to get at something yep. in, in a performance. And that makes perfect sense because how we interpret left to right is forward because of how we read. Yeah. So the protagonists are progressing. There you go. And the antagonist regresses, which is there, against. There you go. So that's just because that's how we read books. That's beautiful. What a great little piece of information. Though, yeah. You know, but so that that's how that scene is set up. I remember it as well. Yeah. There's definitely parts. Paul comes for sure. in. Yeah. yeah There's yeah, that yeah. amazing profile shot. And it's the, that's when the milkshake line happens. Is that all that side on shot all the way across the room? Mm. I love that. that? Like, oh, it's like that's a straw. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is a straw. We, we've talked about the fact that Daniel is in this mansion. He doesn't have like much of a game to play anymore. So he does things like shooting the bottles and just drinking himself to death and eating steak and spitting it out mm-hmm. and all these things. But he's so obsessed st- still with playing the game that he's drained that area of oil like maybe maybe he doesn't know that Eli's going to buy it but like on the off chance that someone might buy it mm-hmm. he's already fucked them over yes and just the fact that it's Eli that walks in and is the guy who's fallen into that trap yeah it's like he has him at checkmate as soon as he walks in the door it's a very revealing scene for the character of Eli. Yes. We learn a lot of stuff about Eli. We learn that Eli is more of a bullshit artist than we thought he was. Mm. <laughs> we learn that his priorities aren't weren't in the church. And uh, that he's yeah. been lying about the church forever. Yeah. He's willing to... Uh, I'll, I'll let you say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah. the scene where he comes to... First of all, he tries to play it like, I can offer you this opportunity that's a really big opportunity. Mm. And then he sort of reveals that he lost all 
this Lee doesn't have any money, basically. Mm. Which is interesting because earlier in the film, there's a scene where Daniel is watching Eli in front of the train, in the train tracks. And um, he is shaking hands with these older people and he's saying, I'm sorry, I can't run the church or whatever. I'm going on a mission. And he lists off three locations and I can't remember them off the top of my head. But historically, they're all very oil-rich locations. <laughs> and so what you can see what he's doing is not actually going on a mission. He's going to go invest in oil. Yeah. yeah. And whatever his investment in oil was, obviously, it was total shit because he's broke now. Yeah. <laughs> so he goes up to the mansion and he's like, hey, look, I'm actually screwed, you know what I mean? But I can sell you this oil or whatever. And then Daniel mm. does his amazing milkshake analogy. Oh. Which is probably the best line <laughs> in the film. Yeah. I absolutely love that whole little speech. Mm. it's great and it, it, it means a lot more than just like that idea which is where I guess I'll get into the meaning of what I think that's about he explains that you know he's a, drunk his milkshake essentially which yeah. to me actually means my business model is better than your business model yeah. and the thing that you have to sell which is religion is not as valuable as the thing that I have to sell which is money. oil and money, yeah. <laughs> which is the economy. Money wins. Yeah, yeah. and he, he in the twentieth he... century it won, right? I yeah, mean, like yeah. The, the world wars came and there was a huge demand for oil, and even today there's countries that are being invaded for oil. Like, yeah, it, you know, and the world completely shifted to this like complete distrust and skepticism about religion and this huge uh, belief in money and money translated to political power and political. Power translates to control over religion in some sense. And so what Daniel's saying in that scene is like, this is the 20th century and your religion is not sustainable as like yeah. a business model. And yeah. because business is king for Daniel, he believes that to be the top priority. He believes he's one, you know? Yeah. And even when he's chasing Eli down the alleyway and he says the thing about the church, he's like, I am the third. third. Yeah. What he's saying is he's essentially a prophet of what's going to like a, like a religious prophet of what's going to happen in the 20th century, which wow. is that the world's going to unfold in, in such a way where money is king and your religion doesn't matter anymore. That's wow. That's huge. Yeah. When you say it like that, that is undeniable. I that, never thought of it like that. That's amazing. That yeah. is so true. Yeah, it's very it's very sad. <laughs> and it's very, it, it, yeah. I think the reason it's so sad is because Daniel's so focused on winning that he winning changes to competition, which means that he has to be set at odds against Eli, and it means that he has to that he takes a lot of pleasure in humiliating him. He gets him to stand up and basically like because he was humiliated in church, he has to have the last word. It's mm. a little bit like in Punch Drunk Love. Yeah, like, um, oh, yeah. Oh, that's that. now it's done. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. So he he makes Eli say, you know. You want to remit to me that you're a false prophet yeah. because, you know, I'm the real prophet yeah. of what's going to happen God, in the world. God is a superstition. Yeah, exactly. And then he has to blaspheme in order to do it. And then, he's, and then he, after he blasphemes, he tells them that he's already drained it. Yes. Which is just like, yeah, you just are so fucking evil. Yeah, yeah, that's all he's doing, yeah. And, and Eli then can only get out of it by lying more. He's like, um, we're brothers, we're brothers, you know what I mean? You're my old friend, yeah, exactly. Daniel. But, my old friend. But they were never friends. No. They always hated Always each other. enemies. And they were yeah. always at odds. And, and there's even like a little bit of a biblical way in which he's killed, which is, there's that club to the... Oh, is that end. how Abel is yeah, killed? It's exactly there you Abel fucking go. Abel. Yeah. So, and that's also a little bit linked to Eli's family because there's a scene earlier in the film where Eli stands up across the dinner table <laughs> and runs and gets his father on the ground. Oh, oh, yeah. And his father's name is Abel in the film. Holy shit. And so Eli is sort of facing the consequences for doing that to his father. And mm -hmm. Daniel is the guy who's going to make that happen to him now. Yeah. So is, there's a little, little Cain and Abel reference in there, which is quite nice. Drained dry, Eli. I'm so sorry. Oh, man. So fucking good. So that's probably also... I love that he... Uh, sorry to interrupt no. you. I love that he kills him with the freaking bowling pin. Oh, it's great. Which is just like... It's obviously a luxury piece in his house. Yes. Like he's killed him with his wealth with as well. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, you were saying. No, no, it's, I'm just saying that's probably what the title's about as well. Because, mm. I mean, I, I actually heard an interview with um, Paul being interviewed by Henry Rollins of Black Flag for people who know but he, um, Henry Rollins used to host a little like independent movie channel on TV and he was asking Paul about it I think weeks before pre-production or something 
and um, Paul said, I was thinking we should call it There Might Be Blood because I don't know how the film's going to turn out. I didn't know it was going to happen in the last scene or whatever. That's maybe what the title about There Will Be Blood is about. In a film-centric sense, it's about people getting killed over oil. Mm. But in a real world sense, it's about people getting killed over oil. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's the sense that in this shift to the 20th century, there's going to be a lot of bloodshed over oil, which there was. I mean, it doesn't pull knew that obviously he's writing it in like 2006 or whatever it is mm. but that's the point when it's, the bush administration is like sure around then yeah, yeah absolutely and that's what there will be i mean it's a prophet it's like a it's a prophecy as a title in the same way that like daniel's a prophet oh my god that's very that's uh, amazing cool title. <laughs> yeah I mean, like, yeah it is god damn shit so with the trailer for there will be blood i heard this recently so they they had a studio approved trailer that was like cut by paul and the trailer company and all this kind of stuff and uh paul didn't really like it (laughs) and uh so paul went and he cut his own trailer and he released it without their permission and they were going to get on his ass and give him a lot of grief over it Mm -hmm. and then the trailer fucking blew up online because it was an amazing trailer Mm -hmm. and it did so well to sell the film that they ended up keeping that trailer who would have thought that filmmakers should have their own trailer oh Oh, man would have saved me a lot of time watching a number of films yeah would have saved me a lot of spoilers yes (laughs) yeah (laughs) gosh (laughs) absolutely should have changed the name of the movie to like plain view or something (laughs) oh yeah Yeah, yeah. fucking what's it the hard oil hard oil oil, (laughs) the book it's based on is called oil yeah is it yeah 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 I'm gonna have to read that. I don't know how similar it is. Oh, I can read. Really so right? it's so yeah. The is it really the, similar? There was actually a movie made in the I think the forties that was more of a direct adaptation towards the book, and it's sort of I don't even know the name of the movie, but it has this like beat over the head environmentalism uh, message yeah. where, it, but it, but the environmental message it's peddling is like, and oil can exist in conjunction with <laughs> which is really cringe <laughs> but I guess you have to believe that if you're living in the 40s yeah, yeah. they don't know yet and yeah. the wars are going on and you can't really tell anybody to not use oil because you're at war so <laughs> but like <laughs> there's this um so the movie is based off the first uh, 200 or 250 first pages from the book mm. and the religious thing is not really in there as much so that was Paul's sort of contribution like the book's pretty much straight capitalism book and um, the growth of capitalism and the, the transition from uh, modernity to post-modernity. But like the, I think the author of the book loosely based the, the main character in the book off the original owner of the mansion at the end of the There Will Be Blood movie. Right. Shit, all Wait, right. Wait, so that's the same actual mansion? Yes, that's the real mansion. It's oh, a museum shit. in real life. Nice. Um, so they, and according to Daniel uh, Day-Lewis in interviews, he said that it was very frightening shooting there because they allowed them very very little time to shoot that final scene and there were a lot of guards around but the guards weren't in the room and so daniel was like i hate to think what we what they might have been thinking <laughs> while we were screaming at <laughs> oh each other. my god because like, you can imagine he's like, throwing bowling I mean, balls we've shot shit in places yes but like we've never <laughs> uh maybe accidentally destroyed a mansion in the process like no. they're going at it yeah and like there's and you can think like people it's old too like it's old wood like it's probably very well built to its credit <clears throat> but like you know, you know how how much could you easily destroy it bro like, was literally throwing bowling balls oh, yeah and, like swinging around throwing people and shit. Yeah. And shit. yeah i love that line where he's like after he says i drink your milkshake and paul goes don't bully me daniel <laughs> and daniel's response is, is screaming at him and throwing his face into the ground it's like somebody would have got really hurt and the place would have got destroyed but yes it's a real museum or real um that's yeah. insane that he's filmed in that <clears throat> particular house yeah very very cool wow Film can be pretty fitting. <clears throat> it can be poetic and like fitting yeah. sometimes, can't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you guys know how uh, HW was cast? Oh, a no. little bit. But go tell it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, H, the guy who plays HW, I can't remember his name unfortunately right now, but um, it is literally his only acting credit. Yeah. He's never acted before and he never acted after. Mm-hmm. Really? And the, the way that he got the role is that the casting director got pulled over and fined i think for like speeding got a speeding ticket and eventually got started talking to the cop that pulled her over 
and they got to know each other a little bit during this conversation. She said, oh, she's the casting director uh, for a new PTA movie. Yeah. And that they need a kid. And the couple was like, oh, I got a kid. <laughs> I got a kid that uh, kind of suits like, sounds like what you're looking for. And then they obviously like met the kid and just really liked him. And then just cast him in the movie. You're kidding. The yeah. Kid's a, the kid's a real Texan kid. He's like a, a cattle rider or a bull rider. Yeah. That's what he did, and he was just a guy. And he had apparently, according to Paul, he'd never seen a film camera before. And they thought he was appropriate, so they put him in the film. Yeah. <laughs> what? Looked, his yeah. only film credit is fucking There Will Be Blood across from Daniel Day Lewis, like an Oscar <laughs> winning film. He's probably still riding with cows. <laughs> probably. <laughs> probably. And yeah. you know what? I bet he's happy as shit yeah, doing yeah. it. <laughs> fuck yeah. Dude That's, never uh, acted again. It's hilarious. What the fuck? That is fuck? awesome. But he That's him. amazing. He did, did the casting director get out of the speeding ticket. Nah, I think they still have it. <laughs> come on. <laughs> but it's oh, poetic. Come on. Yeah. Isn't that like, that's like the universe, like I'm not really all that much into this stuff, but sometimes there's a synchronicity where it's like, no, this is happening. Hmm. Yeah, right. Not that, like we are realigning. Some, there's, sometimes you just wonder with the probabilities and the chance and the luck of the way that things align and you're just like, surely that must have been orchestrated. Yeah. yeah. The kid is... Um, by no means the best child actor I've ever seen, but he's very appropriate, and there's not very much in it that makes me think that he is not a good actor. I think what does him a great deal is that this kid's probably grown up amongst a lot of Texan folk, and what I like about his performance, I feel, is that I can see him trying to, like, imitate older people, like, with his mannerisms and how he moves. Uh, that, that works yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For the character, and looked, because yeah. of the way that he would have been raised, mm. yeah. the way he's dressed like, as well. It seems like he's like yeah. almost looking up to Daniel in a way, yeah. which makes it a little bit more heartbreaking when he comes back to that farm that one day, or the, the, the rig that one day, punches the shit out of Daniel. <laughs> it's great. He's like a really, he's really fitting when he has to like scream and yell and worry about that. It's like he has this reserved demeanor the rest of the time, which a lot of kid actors don't have but he really has it and so when he breaks up in those moments he's really really good yeah really like his performance all right everybody well thank you very much for listening to our episode there will be bleed up oh sorry <laughs> there will be blood <laughs> can't help myself from <laughs> plugging our own a movie true, sorry. absolute spin fucking in, king in the vein of daniel Plainview. <laughs> yeah, yeah literally like, like everything we there will be bleed now up. here's a thing hw i'm producing my own film <laughs> it's gonna be very good it's, it's about a boxer yeah. see now this is a boxer <laughs> yeah. um no okay that was there will be blood what a film how does it stack up in terms of against the other ptas oh that's so tough I reckon we've got to leave ranking to the end. I yeah, feel. sure. I, it's it, my it, favorite PTA. To to his previous catalog, man, I love Punch Drunk Love. Man. <laughs> yeah, it's I fucking, my. I fucking God. really like this that. Isn't, this isn't my favorite PTA. Yeah. I don't know that it's one of my favorite PTAs, but I do think that all things considered, like up until this point, at the very least, this is the best film he had made up until this point. Yeah. I'm not really convinced to say it's the best. Uh, screenplay or the best visually or the best anything but I think as a whole as like a piece of cinema up until this point it's probably the best PTA film. yeah it's technically like the it's, most impressive it's remarkable yeah it's like nothing you could cut it's like almost three hours and it goes like this yeah it does. yes it's beautiful and beautifully paced Noah as you were saying while we were driving over here like it's actually probably on the more affordable side of period pieces as well for sure Oh, what yeah. a production there mm. was like, an interview where BPA said that he said he went to a bunch of investors to begin it off and, and the figure that they had was actually higher than what they ended up making it for and he said to the people's credit who didn't invest in it that you know it didn't actually end up costing because we had no idea how much anything would cost he said mm. so yeah I mean aside from that set piece of that oil geyser essentially costumes like they found a town in, in Texas where they like shot a whole bunch of old movies like Giant if anybody's familiar you know, it, it was shot on a location. Mm. He said, PTA said, we had to drive around until we found a place where there wasn't a domino sign in the background. <laughs> wow. so, also, you know, so they had to find a place that looked like convinc convincingly be that. And obviously you had to build some structures and stuff. Yeah. But yeah. as far as like pieces go, this isn't atonement. 
This isn't like yeah. <laughs> we don't need like huge city blocks and like thousands of extras and it's mm. pretty contained. It's a pretty contained film. Yeah, it's out in the wilderness for like lots of it. Sure, you could convert a... this to a play if you wanted to. I think. Yeah, definitely. Pretty a uh, pretty popular area too. Like I know we're wrapping up, but little fun fact I'm sure you guys have heard is when that fire happened, when the oil explosion happens, mm. and there's all those smoke clouds in the air. Uh, there was a little film filming just over the hill cool. nearby called No Country <laughs> for Old Men, <laughs> yeah. and uh, they had to they had to wrap filming for That's the day so because fun. you could yeah, see the smoke cloud in the fun. air. No way! Yeah, that is hilarious. Yeah. So I... they had Deacons over here and Robert Ellsworth over here, both nominated for best cinematography that year, both nominated for best picture. The two best. The two, two best, best deer... westerns of the decade. Yeah. Filming in the same. They time. They were filming a couple kilometers apart. They were so close together that that literally no country had to wrap filming for the day because the smoke cloud wouldn't clear. Here's one for you. Pretty crazy. Deacons would have been so fucking pissed. Oh, can you <laughs> imagine? He's like, <laughs> he's like on the phone right. Like, you <laughs> turn that fucking thing off. Yeah. Natural lighting as well. Like nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, literally. Um, yeah. They, they, they send over, they each have a champion, like Deacons puts on the boxing gloves and so does Ellsworth, <laughs> and they just duke it out for who can shoot each day. Yeah. Do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? Yeah, literally. You know I mean? It's like the Coens are like, I've made this. PTS, oh, well, I've made this. Yeah. Fair up. enough. I'll Imagine. see you at the Oscars. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Anton Chigurh versus Daniel Plainview. Who you got? Oh. I got Daniel Plainview. Well, like in a fight to the death? Fucking not hand to hand hand to hand I think you have to go Anton Chigurh yeah. but um, is, that that yeah. is that how you say the uh, last yes. name is that how you say the last name yes yes it is okay. have the camel gun or not but yes true <laughs> actually no it still probably win <laughs> he would still he would still probably win yeah. Daniel Daniel Plainview got that dog in him though he did true. True. he, he got do. that I don't know he'd, step he'd out do of the something car, please sir I need you to step out of the car please <laughs> can we just hold still hold still Oh, dude, that's just terrifying. That guy just believed him in, like, full-on, like, good faith, and then just, that's it, lights out. That's fucked. Doesn't go good. That, that is evil. Two evil, super evil characters shooting in close proximity mm. in that town in Texas. Did you say it was, Noah? Yes. It's crazy. Next, anyway. Next series, Coen Brothers. Like, anyway, yeah. All right, okay. <laughs> would love that. Yeah, would would that. fucking love that. There's right. a lot of Coen Brothers films yeah. I haven't seen, too, oh, so okay, cool. that's really good. We're wrapping it up. There All will right. be blood. There will be blood. Okay, guys, thank you so much for listening. We enjoyed so much watching this again. I loved revisiting it. It's something I'll try and watch probably once every two years. It's definitely one of PTA's it's most a impressive. It's one to revisit. I yeah. revisit it a lot. Yeah. It's one of his, it's one of his, like one of the great modern epics. Yeah. If you're ever sure. feeling particularly ambitious as well, it is a good watch. Look, I'm not going to lie to you. Like as a hot blooded young man, if you're feeling ambitious, it's a good watch. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's All like, right? it's also a good cautionary tale yeah, for it's a hot blooded young man out there. Definitely. <laughs> yes, definitely um, but uh, our next film that we're going to review from PTA is The Master which I'm super excited for. Uh, we will see how we go. I'm very excited for it. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon. Doot, doot, loot. Nardwine. Nardwine.